exactly what human. I've been tracking Sasquatches for 25 years. But these animals, in fact, are real. I've seen them. They're here. I'm having a really difficult time finding an explanation for this. There's something on the hill. I do think there's a squatch in these woods. This is Paranormal Skeptic Academy. Using critical thinking and scientific evidence to analyze your favorite ghost hunting shows. You'll never view them the same again. You have been warned. <laughs> Finding Bigfoot. Where to begin? I can start with the evidence of Bigfoot's existence or a bio on each cast member, or I can just stop right here before going down this rabbit hole. But for you, dear listeners, I'm going to jump right into this rabbit hole feet first. Finding Bigfoot could be a short series, if they ever found Bigfoot. The premise of the show is not much different than the ghost hunting shows. The team seeks out individuals who've had sightings and then investigates the surrounding area. And using the word investigate is being very generous. So far, all they do is confirmation bias. They verify and reassure their clients that everything they have witnessed is true and a Bigfoot is indeed the cause. They do some really terrible reenactments, and when the client confirms their experience with the reenactment, boom, evidence. Then they look around in the woods and wait for something to happen, and any noise they hear or heat signature they see, they attribute it to a Bigfoot. That's it. That's the premise of this show. So with that out of the way, let's do a brief overview of the Bigfoot movement and the evidence for the existence of Bigfoot over the past 50 plus years. Now, before I get emails, I'm using the term Bigfoot to mean Sasquatch, which is what, the scientific term for Bigfoot? It's one and the same. Before we get into the cast and crew of the show, let's first look at the evidence for the existence of Bigfoot. This part is important because the entire premise of this show rides on the fact that Bigfoot exists. You see, the group, except for one, accepts the premise that the species Bigfoot is real. It's important that we look at the historical data and see what evidence we really have and the role it plays in this show. Plain and simple, the bulk of Bigfoot evidence lies in eyewitness accounts. That's right. The bulk of evidence for the existence of Bigfoot is anecdotal. What you'll see in the Finding Bigfoot show is that they throw at the viewer eyewitness account after eyewitness account after eyewitness account. Anecdote after anecdote. And to quote the mad skeptic, the plural of anecdote is anecdotes, not evidence. The former editor of the now defunct Journal of Cryptozoology Review, Ben Roche, had this to say about eyewitness accounts and cryptids. Cryptozoology is based largely on anecdotal evidence. While physical phenomena can be tested and systematically evaluated by science, anecdotes cannot, as they are neither physical nor regulated in content or form. Because of this, anecdotes are not reproducible and are thus untestable. Since they cannot be tested, they are not falsifiable and are not part of the scientific process. Also, reports usually take place in uncontrolled settings and are made by untrained, varied observers. People are generally poor eyewitnesses and can mistake known animals for supposed cryptids, unknown animals, or poorly recall details of their sightings. Simply put, eyewitness testimony is poor evidence. More often than not, eyewitness accounts are recorded or retold by untrained individuals that bring their own bias to the situation. This is why scientists, lawyers, psychologists, and judges don't rely on eyewitness accounts. But what our Bigfoot hunting friends do is try to find credible eyewitnesses. They'll look for professionals, upstanding citizens, and otherwise trustworthy people. You'll hear from Bigfoot hunters that so-and-so is trustworthy or so-and-so is a professional in a specific field and use that to justify their experience. All that doesn't matter. An eyewitness account is still an eyewitness account and wholly unreliable from any source. Next up in order of magnitude are footprints the very piece of evidence that we get the name Bigfoot from. Unlike eyewitness accounts, footprints are actual physical evidence. Unfortunately, a lot of so-called Bigfoot footprints are hoaxes or misidentifications from other animals. Even if we accept the fact that some Bigfoot hunters have actual footprints, 
the ones they claim are real vary greatly from one another. Some prints have five toes. Some have two toes. They have been others with three, four, or six toes. Did all these tracks come from the same species? Did they come from the same creature? Given the evidence, neither. In 2000, the Bigfoot Field Research Organization found what they say is the first body print of Bigfoot. They found this large body print near Mount Adams in Washington State. How did the Bigfoot make this print? The BFRO claims the Bigfoot was lying on its side on the edge of a money bank and reached over to grab some bait. It stretched and almost crawled to reach the bait. Given the impression and the bait location, this makes for an odd approach. One has to ask, why didn't the Bigfoot just stand up and walk over to the bait? The BFRO has an explanation for that. Quote, one explanation is immediately apparent. The animal did not want to leave tracks, unquote. So it made a body impression, one could say a track, by trying not to make a track? If this animal is smart enough to avoid footprints, surely it's smart enough to avoid a body impression. Again, we have very little evidence to go on, and we have the BFRO twisting their so-called evidence to fit their bias. After eyewitness accounts and footprints, we have recordings. The most famous of these is the Patterson film from the 1960s. Simply put, this video was a hoax, with a well-established chain of evidence to support the video being a hoax. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but Skeptoid episode 375 is a whole episode dedicated to it. However, some in the Bigfoot community still think this video is legitimate. Over the years, many videos have popped up reportedly showing Bigfoot, but none have been verified as authentic. It seems we can categorize Bigfoot films and photos into three categories. Hoaxes, misidentifications, and pareidolia. Friend of the show, Luis Castillo, co-host of the Geeks and Ghosts podcast, got into a Facebook argument with some Bigfoot people about a black spot in a photo. And he accurately pointed out it could be anything. He saw a cat, or a blow-up doll, in the picture. I guess that says more about his state of mind than the picture, but the point remains the same. It's not evidence, it's pareidolia. The last category of evidence are somatic samples, i.e. hair and blood. However, to date, no sample has been positively identified as coming from a Bigfoot. Alleged hair samples have turned out to be nothing more than elk, bear, or cow. Blood samples return similar results with one sample being transmission fluid. The evidence is weak, if not non-existent. Keep all this in mind when we analyze an episode of Finding Bigfoot because these Bigfoot investigators, again using that term loosely, already assume Bigfoot exists and are looking for evidence to support that bias. They are not out to determine the existence of Bigfoot, following the evidence wherever it may lead, but instead are looking for evidence to prove that Bigfoot exists. This is the same with ghost hunters. They are looking for evidence to support their belief. Now, with all that being said, let's get to know our host a little better. Matt Moneymaker Matt grew up in Los Angeles, California and sparked an interest in Bigfoot at the age of 11. He went on to attend UCLA and during his college years he began hooking up with fellow Bigfoot researchers. In 1987, while hiking in the mountains of Ventura County, California, he discovered a line of alleged Bigfoot tracks and from then on, Bigfoot became his passion. In the 1990s, he moved to Akron, Ohio to attend law school. The area was a hotbed for Bigfoot sightings. In 1994, Matt had an alleged encounter with a Bigfoot while out investigating in Kent, Ohio. In 1995, Matt founded the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization. Matt created a website that allowed anyone from all over the world to report Bigfoot sightings. Not surprisingly, the number of reports grew exponentially. His most famous case is the before-mentioned Bigfoot body impression in 2000. And now he graces our televisions with his idea of science and the truth about Bigfoot. Cliff Brackman Born and raised in Long Beach, California, Cliff is a trained jazz musician and has dabbled in various scientific disciplines. Although he doesn't hold any degrees in biology or anthropology, he is seen as an expert in Bigfoot circles because he spends over 200 days a year in the wilderness hunting this elusive creature. To date, he has not found this creature. James Bobo Fay 
Bobo grew up in Manhattan Beach, California, and has been interested in Bigfoot for as long as he could remember. His claim to fame is being a roadie for Sublime in the 90s. He said his extensive travel and interactions with people led him to gather thousands of eyewitness accounts about Bigfoot. He has used these eyewitness accounts to speculate about the Bigfoot's behavior, and this makes him an expert. Apparently in 2001, while on investigation with veteran Bigfoot researcher John Friedas, Bobo saw his first Bigfoot and has had several sightings since. And yet, the evidence for these sightings is lacking. Rene Holland Rene is the token skeptic of the group. Rene is a trained biologist and is the only one on the team with an actual scientific degree. Rene does not believe in the existence of Bigfoot, but keeps an open mind about their existence, as all scientists should. Her expertise is in the interaction of brown bears and salmon. She has traveled all over North America and Canada, and despite her interactions with locals, natives, and other biologists who have claimed to have Bigfoot encounters, she still remains unconvinced of their evidence. You see, Rene actually relies on physical evidence to support her belief, not broad speculation like the other three. That is our team for finding Bigfoot. It will be interesting to see the interaction between the believers and the lone skeptic. But I do give them credit. At least they do have a skeptic on their show, unlike most ghost hunting shows. Maybe Renee will be our Brian Daly, but we shall see. Tonight on Finding Bigfoot. For generations, people in Florida have believed that Bigfoot's monstrous cousin, the foul-smelling skunk ape, has been lurking in their foreboding swamps and impenetrable pine forests. What was that? I just heard something up in front of me, guys. Countless sightings on record, the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, led by Matt Moneymaker, heads south to investigate the latest reports made by a frightened family who says their home is subject to nightly visits by a skunk ape. This thing sounded monstrous. I'm thinking, oh my God, this creature has opened my door. I was frightened. As the BFRO gathers more leads, they zero in on the Florida Everglades. And with the skunk ape quickly running out of places to hide, the team believes they may have found the creature's clandestine lair and definitive proof of the skunk ape's existence. We got something over here. What is that? You see that out there? In this episode, we are looking for the elusive skunk ape, which I guess is a cousin of Bigfoot that smells really bad. All I know is that they are in the panhandle of Florida, just south of the Georgia state line in what is known as Eastern Alabama. A husband-wife duo report almost nightly run-ins with a local skunk ape around their remote home. I've already told you what I think Bigfoots are. Not real. But let's hear Matt explain what he thinks Bigfoots are. It's our belief that Bigfoots are related to primates. However, the ones here in the south may be unique. According to eyewitness accounts, the southern Bigfoots are more reddish in color and smaller than the ones in the north. Locals call these creatures skookums or skunk apes due to their unforgettable foul odor. You got that? Smaller, redder, and smellier Bigfoots. Matt goes on to say that the western side of Florida is densely packed forest and miles upon miles of swampland. He also tells us that the explosion of home development has led to increased sightings of skunk apes. The team is driving to the site and analyzing photos sent in by the clients. What is telling in this first scene is that the homeowners are true believers in Bigfoot and are looking for reassurance that their belief is correct. This will drive the investigation and interaction between the team and the homeowners. The evidence they sent in was a video of a handprint on a storm door and a plastered mold of a foot impression. The team is anxious to get on site and take some measurements and see this evidence firsthand. Cliff is visibly excited to meet these people because of the frequency of their sightings around their home, which according to him is extremely rare. It's rare to see a Sasquatch at all, but to see one numerous times at your home, it's, it's just crazy rare, really. The team meets with the homeowners and they want to get started right away. They are off to examine the first piece of evidence, a bent over bird feeder. The bird feeder is up on a pole that is about five to six feet high and is bent down parallel to the ground. The bird feeder the homeowner showed to the team has been bent back to its straight position. The bird feeder incident, it was bent over. One feeder was completely gone. The other feeder was there, empty. 
We knew it was something that was not normal going on here. So Bigfoots love bird seed so much that they bent a bird feeder over to grab the seed. Let's see how our team explains this one. I'm sure they'll come up with a plausible explanation. Bigfoots would be interested in any type of food left out by humans, including dog food or cat food or bird seed. So if a Bigfoot sees a bird feeder like the one the Bridges had, it's going to knock it down and take that bird seed. Now this is the actual pole that, that we found bent that day, and the pole was totally in the ground like this, and it was bent over with this still in the ground. I'll bet I could bend it like that. Well, you can sure try. All right, strong man, see what you can do. I had to like anchor it with my foot to keep it from pulling out of the ground. So you know, it was something with hands and feet that pulled it and bent it, it wasn't like a bear. Well, that was pretty easy for Bubbo to do. He grabs a pole up high and places his foot at the base of the pole and then bends it like in the photo. Bobo says a bear couldn't do this. It had to be something with hands and feet. I guess bears don't have hands and feet. So I went to the Google machine and typed in bear bird feeder pole. And this is what I found. A home video of a black bear grabbing a bird feeder. The bird feeder in this video is similar to the one from our homeowners. The spikes that secured into the ground are exactly the same. And lo and behold, the black bear pulled and bent the pole just like our homeowners. Solid proof that a bear can indeed do what they said one couldn't do. But Matt has a different explanation. The fact that it took coordination and the use of Bobo's hands and feet to bend the pole tells me that whatever bent it had opposable thumbs. That means it was either a person or a squatch. Or a bear. But wait, there's more to this bird feeder saga. Apparently the bird feeder, which resembles a lantern, rolled down a hill, crashed into a log, and broke. The homeowners think that Bigfoot took the bird feeder, broke it on the log to get to that precious seed inside, and just left it there. How inconsiderate. Okay, this is the stump. The feeder was broken. Go ahead and break it. I, you want to well, break you, it? You, Bobo, how guess. about you? Would you like to break it since you bent my pole? All right. Watch your eyes, guys. Okay, now the gasket. Just pull the gasket out. And this was laying here. This gasket was wrapped here. Wrapped. Like double wrapped. Oh, double wrapped. And this gasket was wrapped here. Wow. Yeah. That's a thumb. That's a thumb. That is hard to get off once it's wrapped. Now, it's possible that a bear pulled down that pole and one of the feeders broke loose and rolled down the hill. But I just don't see it likely that rolling down the hill and landing on the log broke that glass. To me, just the fact that it's broken without even the gaskets is very strong circumstantial evidence that this was something that had hands. That spooked them, and it did convince us that this wasn't just misinterpretation of bear activity. Whatever broke the bird feeder had hands? The female in that video was our skeptic, by the way. They try to recreate the scene and jump to all types of conclusions based on one picture. Simply put, it required a thumb to do this, therefore, Bigfoot. They move on to the next piece of evidence. Happened. Having tea on the porch one morning, I noticed that this was broken, was pushed in. Look at that. You know what I think happened there? I think it, it was on here. I think it came out of that greenhouse and it was using this to help itself get over the fence and you're talking hundreds of pounds. It really seemed to me that a Sasquatch had come over that fence, had been up at the greenhouse, and then when it retreated, it was in a hurry and probably pushed its hand down all of its weight to pull itself out before stepping over that fence. Really? You got all that based on a dent on a fence pull cap? I've heard a speculation before, but Moneymaker takes it to a whole other level. And it won't be the last time. 
I headed back to the house, and as I was going back in the house, my housekeeper showed up. And she looks down, and there's this huge footprint. Okay, oh, you got a cast here. That's yes. great. And it was about, wow, look at that. That would be the toe. Check it out, Cliff. Wow, that's a big boy. Looks like we do have a big toe here, a nice uh, deep heel impression here in a ball. And of course, right here, exactly where we'd expect a little bit of a bump. The footprint at the base of the post alone is interesting. However, that combined with the indentation on top of the post kind of starts painting a picture for us about what might have happened that night. The Sasquatch hurtling or climbing over the fence at that point might have been one possible reason that happened. The cast they made looks like a giant slice of pizza. You only see a foot impression if you want to see a foot impression. And they only have one impression. If a Bigfoot made that impression, and at the frequency with which it visits the home, they should find prints all over the place. Again, they are just connecting dots to a picture that doesn't exist. As they pile up the evidence, they get more and more convinced that a Bigfoot was there, or they were already convinced one was there, and are just looking for evidence to support that belief. They head back to the house to view their last and most shocking piece of evidence. What I'm about to show you was the most frightening and spookiest for me. One night, I'm awoken by this horrible growl. I was spooked, and I touch Bill and kind of shake him, and he doesn't move, and I'm kind of in shock here because this thing sounded monstrous. How far off was the sound? That's what I was it was very close. It was here. It was on the porch. I was spooked. Kind of in shock here. The next day, right here, was a huge handprint. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this creature has opened my door. So that means it opened up the door. Yes. And touched it. Yes. I can see why you were scared. And have been ever since. The thumb was way long. The fingers were huge and long. And the hair. arm was wide, and it was, you could see then little impressions of the hair, and it was greasy, oily. It was nasty. It looked similar to a human, but it was, it was just too large. And I'm thinking, and he popped it and grabbed it. And when he hit, this hit his arm, I'm thinking that's when he growled. A greasy handprint on the inside of a storm door, and this lady was able to pull that whole story together based on a noise and the handprint? Remember what I said about eyewitness accounts before? Our skeptic Renee wants to test this handprint hypothesis. She wants to try and come up with a plausible, non-Bigfoot explanation. Let's see how she does. Carolyn claims that she heard this guttural, growling, screaming, horrible noise on the deck. As they opened the door, they saw this what they claim is a handprint on the inside. We tried to figure out how big that handprint was based off of the known sizes that we can see on the door in the film. And 7 16th inches long. When we figured out the approximate size of the hand, we found that from the base of the thumb to the tips of the fingers was 11 inches. OK, well, that's a start. My suggestion is Bobo grease up his hands. Just with your fingertips, Bobo, touch where she's saying to touch. We wanted to do our best to recreate this situation where it happened. So I got some hand lotion and asked Bobo to mess his hands up so we would have something to leave on the surface. All right, so it's about here? Yes. So lift your hand away, Bobo, without moving. Here we have a definite fingerprint, right? Just his handprint alone was about eight inches. The original print is claimed to be 11 inches. So if you were taking your fingertips, Bobo, and add them to where she had the length, and only at the part of the way back, then drop your palm and see if you can drag your palm and recreate it. My hypothesis is that this is a human hand that may have smeared across that glass, making it look bigger. So now what I want to do is have Bobo take his hand, smear it across the glass, compare it against what Carolyn saw, see if she notices the difference. All right, I'll do, I'll do the drag one up here. And then drag your palm, yeah. 
Carolyn, does, does Bobo's recreation here in any way uh, replicate the size or any of the details that you saw in the original handprint? Not really. Not really at all? <laughs> Not really. Renee comes up with a good test and it shows there could be an alternative, non-Bigfoot explanation. But they just throw it out the window when they ask the homeowner if their recreated handprint looks the same as the one they saw on that night. This is the same homeowner who was already convinced that a Bigfoot has been on her property. Are we surprised she dismissed Renee's explanation? Of course not. Matt has seen enough and is eager to do a nighttime investigation. So far, we are right on point with our ghost hunter comparison, even down to the nighttime investigation. It's 11.35 p.m. and the team gathers on the back porch to discuss their strategy for the night. Matt wants to put Renee deep into the woods with no lights and no one around her with the hopes Bigfoot won't see her and walk right past her. Renee gets into place as the investigation begins. Matt and Cliff span out and are going to attempt to approach Renee from the side. Bubba was on the back deck making vocalizations trying to draw out the Bigfoot. No, this, this is just weird. I'm going to do a call from up here. Bobo, go ahead and do a long, low motor. Anything for you, big boy. just heard something up in front of me, guys. Renee, we heard the knock, too, on the same direction you heard it from. It must have been real loud, because we were quite a distance from the property when we heard it. Knocking is a communication technique that Sasquatches use. I'm not exactly sure what they're saying, but I think a lot of the times it's something like, I'm here, where are you? The stupid, it hurts so bad. Bobo makes a noise, they hear a knock, and they're convinced it's a Bigfoot. Then Cliff says, that's how Bigfoots communicate? By knocking? What evidence do we have for that besides post hoc rationalization? It's ridiculous, I tell ya. Renee sees something, but I'm not sure how, as it's pitch black and she doesn't have a camera viewfinder to see through. We cut to an infrared camera and see Renee's heat signature. The team then hears a growl, and then the speculation runs wild, brother. That was directly behind me now. Can you guys confirm? Directly behind me, 12 o'clock, to the house. I've got a visual on Renee. There's nothing behind her. Cliff says there's nothing behind you. That was you, Bobo, right? What was that? You didn't do that, Bobo? Negative. Great. Dude, he didn't do it yet. So we hear this whoa, big, deep sound coming from the south side of the house, and it just struck us as saying, wait a minute. Was that a skunk ape? I think there's one here. I think it finally responded to the house. It sounds like a growl, but I'm not sure how doctored the audio is on these shows. It could be a bear. And if that's the case, it's probably not a good idea to be in the woods at night. Matt and crew are convinced it was a skunk ape. And just then, Bobo sees something on his infrared camera. I got something coming towards us. Is it moving towards you or moving towards me? Towards me. Whenever you see a glowing hot shape on a thermal imager like that, that white hot, like a mammal, your heart races. I don't know what it is. Watch it, man. No, no. Bobo spots an object in the woods. Looks to be a deer, but as he's tracking it, he falls down the steps of the deck, and whatever was out there was spooked, and he can't find it again. After a few hours walking about in the dark, they call it a night and recap their evidence. We did get over that threshold where we know we're definitely hearing stuff, so we know there's some nearby. We've been hearing knocks. What was that? We heard a grunty growl. Whoa. Great. Now we're starting to get a glimpse of what's been going on here, what the bridges have had to deal with on their own. This is confirmation bias through and through by Matt. He already believes a skunk ape is in the area, and those few small pieces of evidence just solidifies that idea in his head. Did we get any real evidence of a Bigfoot? Could what we saw and heard be explained by any number of other creatures that live in those woods? We get a banging noise, a growl that sounds like a lion, and a heat signature that appears to be a deer. That's it. 
That is enough to convince Matt, but I'm far from convinced. And remember, this is the best that they got during their investigation, the stuff they chose to leave in during the final editing process. Matt is convinced that they found an active skunk ape habitat. They want to learn more about this skunk ape, so they head south to a Seminole reservation. Matt seems to believe that these Native Americans have special insight into the skunk ape because, as Matt puts it, they have shared the land with the skunk ape for thousands of years. This is what I mentioned before about using the guise of credible witnesses to substitute for actual evidence. I don't see why Native Americans have any more insight into the skunk ape than a biologist or an anthropologist. They're going to meet with the elders of the Seminole tribe and hear their stories about the skunk ape. Listen to how Matt conflates evidence with anecdote, a common theme throughout these episodes. What's important about this meeting is if the Seminole stories are valid, then that helps further prove that skunk apes do exist in Florida. What? How does that prove skunk ape's existence? Again, and I know this sounds like I'm beating a dead horse here, but they consistently conflate eyewitness accounts as rock-solid evidence, which it is not. The team sits down with the tribal elders, and Bobo asks Herbert, one of the elders, for some advice on living near or around a skunk ape. Tell them not to look at them as a pest or animals. Look at them as a human beings. The only way you can really coexist is to give them respect. Look, I'm not one to disrespect other people's cultures, but these jabronis are taking everything this guy says as gospel just because he's Native American. And to me, that is extremely patronizing. You have to respect cultural beliefs to a certain point, but sometimes you just need to call a spade a spade. Once again, they're going to rely on eyewitness accounts as Cliff asks Herbert if he's ever seen a skunk ape. I think we know the answer to this one. Have you ever actually seen one yourself? Uh, yes, I have. We were going into the swamps and cut logs out in order to build chickies and such. As we were walking this path, there was a palmetto tree standing there. And just then, something grabbed that palmetto leaves down and then boom! Had to be like at least about eight feet tall. And that happened somewhere in this area. Yeah, back in the swamps here. Some of my cousins have seen it, but uh, you have to get a hold of them to, in order to understand what their sightings were. An eight foot tall creature pushed down on some palm leaves. I thought skunk apes were smaller than the traditional Bigfoot. Hm, whatever. Next up is Ron, a white man, so you know we can trust his account. I was driving along a trail and uh... I happen to look out the, the passenger side window of my Jeep. Ron is not a Seminole Indian, but he does live adjacent to their land. He claims he might be sharing his land with a skunk ape. It, it definitely wasn't human. I mean, it was huge. And it was like the, the trees themselves just like opened up and he just sort of backed in and they just closed around him. Now you see me, now you don't. The Case of the Disappearing Skunk Ape. Dun, dun, dun. They close out their meeting, but before we go, Cliff drops this pearl of wisdom. Herbert shared that the Seminole view Sasquatches as another people, much like themselves, then they treat them as another people. I think that one of the things that the Bridges can take away from what Herbert advised is to leave them alone, because the Sasquatches aren't living on the Bridges' land. The Bridges are living on the Sasquatch's land. They are giving advice on how to interact with a creature that doesn't exist. With some intel from Herbert and Ron, they triangulate a place they believe to be the best location for a skunk ape encounter. The team splits up with Bobo and Matt heading out to speak to Herbert's cousin Billy and Cliff and Renee going to follow up with Herbert. They travel deep into Seminole country and meet with Billy where he tells Matt and Bobo about his skunk ape encounter. Yep, it was right out here. It was in the middle of this rainy season. I was walking out there and there was a cypress tree that was over and I walked over it. I looked to the right about 35 yards from me. When I walked up and I looked, it went like this. At this point in the show, we cut to a trivia screen and this is the question they ask and the answer they give. 
What is the reason behind the skunk ape's foul odor? A. Methane. B. Diet. C. Defense mechanism. The answer coming up after the break. The answer is A. Methane. Skunk apes hide in the air pockets of underground alligator dens, and their fur absorbs the pungent methane. Bet you didn't know that fact about a made-up creature, huh? Hell, they could have said his odor was from bad hygiene as a skunk ape only bathes twice a year. That fact could be just as true as the one they made up. The answer they gave was methane from living under the nest of alligators. First of all, wouldn't the alligator get a little upset if it found a Bigfoot squatting in his crib? And second, alligator nests are made just a few feet above water, meaning the bottom of the nest is in the water. So now our skunk apes are aquatic? Make up your damn minds about your made-up creature, will ya? You're confusing me. Let's continue with Billy and the story of his sighting. Wow. Now look at me. My hair stood up on my, on my neck. I was in shock. I'm shaking right now, just thinking about it. I could feel them staring me down. Did you see the legs and the feet? Yeah, I seen, the, I seen the legs. I seen them about like that. He was real long, but I remember him doing something with his feet. Here comes the first brilliant reenactment that I spoke about earlier. Bobo wants to get about the same distance away as this alleged skunk ape and see if he can reenact the story. Bobo marches out into the brush, gets the estimated distance away, and Billy makes a comparison to what he saw and what Bobo was doing. He was a little bit taller than that. About, and about this tall, maybe? A little bit more. Yeah, about right in there. So that's over a foot taller than me. That'd put that thing well over seven foot, close to seven and a half feet. Wow. I got at least a foot above my head before he said that's how tall it was. So you're talking something that's so enormous, it'd weigh at least twice as much as me. You're getting something in the upwards of over 600 pounds. He was able to figure all that out by sticking his hand over his head. These guys are amazing. Matt brings up the foot movement thing the skunk ape was doing and seems to think it was digging for swamp apples. And then goes on to say skunk apes are known to eat a variety of foods which allows them to survive in an environment like this. Excuse me, did he say known? What can you know about a made up creature that you have zero evidence for? I can say skunk apes are known to steal cooling apple pies from window sills and prefers Cool Whip to whipped cream. My explanation is just as valid as theirs because it's made up. Matt then explains that he believes Billy's story because of some arbitrary factors that leads him to believe it wasn't made up. He takes his account as legitimate since the story is unique, but similar to other stories. I can almost guarantee Billy has told this story before, and with each telling, I'm almost positive the details change. Now that's not a knock on Billy, but that's just how we humans recall memories, the way our brains work. Now we switch over to Renee and Cliff as they meet with Herbert to discuss his Bigfoot sighting. We was walking down this path here, and it, it was right about here when I saw it. Right there was the creature where it was standing, and it sounded like he just reached up and grabbed and slapped the leaves down. And it just turned and ran. You know, that's exactly a classic ape territorial display there, making a big noise. Kind of almost just like to startle you before it escapes. Silverback lowland gorilla. They do that. Boom. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I'll pop in there. And sure. Think, yeah, go make some noise. Yeah. yeah. Try to scare us for I'll try, guys. I'm not that big. I'm no bobo, that's for sure. Again, this is just an eyewitness account. And then they try to make connections to known animals, such as silverback gorillas. Because primates, I guess. Renee is going to try and reenact what Herbert saw. Move forward a little bit toward the trees. Okay, right about there. Yeah, that's exactly where it was. Okay, so first you initially, you hear a crash? Yeah, like the palmetto leaves got slapped really hard. Okay, get ready, Herbert. All right. All the branches. <laughs> I can't do all, <laughs> all the branches. You, you're not capable of making that type of noise. So after it moved the palmetto leaves, you said it headed in this direction? Yes, he took off right to where the trees and the bushes are. OK. Renee tried to duplicate the running off into the brush to see if she can do it in a similar manner. Here we go. Two of her stripes is probably one of his. I, 
I just don't get what this is supposed to accomplish. Are they saying that because a mere mortal human cannot accurately depict the alleged event that it had to be Bigfoot? This isn't evidence. Uh, Renee then asks Herbert if he is positive he saw what he saw, and he says yes, because he's been living in and around the Florida swamps all his life and has seen many creatures, but this one was humanoid looking and was like nothing he has ever seen before. Case closed. Bigfoot exists. Matt, Bobo, Renee, and Cliff head to the third and final eyewitness. Braun. So is this the stand of trees where you saw one? Yeah, I was uh, several hundred yards back, and from back there, he was standing right at the tree's edge. My God, he was huge. As I got out of the Jeep, it's like the, the trees opened up, and he took like a step back and they closed up on him. Wow. All right, Bobo, if you'll take two to three steps directly backwards, that's, that's the action that he took at that time. Whoa, he's totally disappearing. When we had Bobo go out there, stand in position, and take a few steps back, we could see exactly what they were talking about. It's as much as the brush moving out of the way as it is the shadows and the deep brush just kind of enveloping him. This is typical Bigfoot behavior. They don't want to be seen. I think Ron actually saw a skunk ape down there on the edge of that cypress strand. All right. I'm back. I'm focused. Whew. Okay. All of these sightings play into each other as the team tries to build a narrative. The last witness described how the Bigfoot vanished into the trees and was gone from sight. This will come into play later on. The team then meets to discuss their plan for searching out Bigfoot in the area. They call a guy in with a drone to help narrow down the search area. They are looking for game trails that a Bigfoot may travel on. With the help of the drone, they have their search area as they wait for night to fall. And night falls, and they split up into two groups using night vision and infrared cameras. And then Matt does his best Bigfoot impression and lets out a high-pitched howl because that's the sound Bigfoots make or something like that. Ah, anyways, and they sit and wait for any noise to confirm what they already think. So you make a howl, you hear a noise, boom, Bigfoot. Hey, that's not my reasoning, that's theirs. Puberty. Well, we got some behind us. Listen, listen to the wood line. Wait a minute. That response sounds like cattle to me, not a Bigfoot. Cliff and Renee scan the area and find a herd of deer and more cattle like noises. You know what? I think they're near a farm. In the shot of the deer, I see what looks like a dwelling, possibly a barn, plus all the cattle-like noises they capture on their microphones leads me to believe they are near a farm. We cut back to Matt and Bobo, and they spot another heat signature standing alone in a clearing. They say it's too big to be a deer, so they jump to the skunk ape immediately. Let's see how this plays out, shall we? We got to the area that the drone identified from the aerial shots, and sure enough... I look through the thermal and there's a large, upright figure just standing stock still out there. What is that? And it just froze, which is what you'd expect a Sasquatch to do in the open. When they get caught, they just freeze and stand still. Dude, that thing's straight up and down. Yeah. Look at it. Keeps staring at us. It was way too big to be a deer. So I was just waiting to see the thing move to get some movement so I could identify what it was. That was Check it weird. Out. Come on, come on, let's go. Matt bravely heads off towards this thing. He gets closer and closer, and the thing doesn't move. Either the skunk ape doesn't see Matt, or it's not a skunk ape. Matt starts walking out in the meadow towards it. It doesn't move, and it's about the same size as Matt. Oh, I'll be damned. Dang, from that angle, you can't tell if it's walking away from you or walking towards you. You would think that was a person or a squatch. 
As Matt gets closer and closer, this thing still doesn't move, and Bobo keeps the camera trained on the object and Matt. The suspense is killing me. What's going to happen? Is Matt going to get mauled by a skunk ape, trampled by a cow, or gored by a deer? I can't wait to find out. I started walking towards it. Unbelievable. And whatever it was just ran off into the woods. There it goes. On at least a half dozen BFRO expeditions over the years, people have spotted Bigfoots and they've observed how Bigfoots could quickly step off and let the brush envelop them, which made them completely disappear. Weird. Well, that was a letdown. The only thing weird is the fact that you didn't show the movement of this thing. They say it moves off into the brush, but they don't show it moving, even though Bobo has his camera trained on it the whole time and didn't have any steps to fall down. Why didn't they show the movement? I think I know why. I think it was just your everyday, run-of-the-mill cow. And when they got close enough to see it move, it moved like a cow. And they didn't want to show that to the viewers because it contradicts everything they've been talking about in this episode. The way the thing stood, the way it didn't move at first, and the way you can see its head turn, plus the cattle noises, leads me to believe it was a cow. Plain and simple. Now let's close out the show, but listen carefully to what Matt says as he gives away his whole game. He says, quote, We came to Florida to find evidence that would prove the existence of the skunk ape. End quote. Sorry, sir. That's just confirmation bias, not science. The skunk ape legend of a foul-smelling Bigfoot-like creature hiding in the swamps has existed for centuries. We came to Florida to find evidence that would prove the existence of this skunk ape. This creature has opened my door. Handprint evidence that's a big boy. A footprint cast. It was right about here. Reliable eyewitness testimony. We got something over here. Our encounters in the wild. What is that? And perhaps even video footage leads the BFRO to believe there are skunk apes here in Florida. I want to thank James Garrison of the Oklahoma Skeptic Society for the support of this show. He has an excellent article on his blog, oklahomaskepticsociety.blogspot.com. Look under 2013 and then under February for the article titled, Bigfoot, the BFRO, Finding Bigfoot, and a Look at the Evidence. James goes into more details about the myth of Bigfoot, as well as some of the beliefs about Bigfoot behavior and habitat, more so than I did here. Hopefully, this little shout-out will get him a few extra pints at his next Skeptics in the Pub meeting. What more can I say about this show? Everything they do is just an extreme form of confirmation bias. They go into these investigations looking to prove the existence of Bigfoot, and that is the crux of their whole presentation. Instead of gathering evidence and coming to a conclusion based on the evidence, they are just gathering what they call evidence to support their own conclusions they already have. I have demonstrated this throughout the entire episode in using their own words. The so-called skeptic didn't really add much and was just kind of there to give the group the illusion of credibility. At the beginning of this episode, I laid out four categories of evidence that Bigfoot investigators cling to, and they hit three of the four. And just like in the opener, the bulk of what they found was anecdotal evidence from seemingly credible people. That's not evidence. It's just anecdotes. I also wanted to test one thing out on my end. I took my digital recorder into my backyard just to record the nighttime noises. I live in a residential area, but my house backs up to a wetlands area with some trees. It's protected, so there's no other homes there. I did this to demonstrate that even in a residential area, the nighttime noise is incredible with a mixture of insects, amphibians, avians, and mammals. What do you think it sounds like in the middle of nowhere where these guys are? Here's what I recorded. 
All right, it's about 8.45 in the evening, and I'm in the back of my yard. It backs up to a wooded area in a little retention pond where storm runoff fills up and filters out into the wetlands behind the house. But what I'm doing is demonstrating just the noises you hear in a residential area from a wooded area to show you what these Bigfoot hunters are supposedly hearing when they're in the dense woods in these remote areas. So I'm going to move the microphone away from my mouth and I'm going to hold it out towards the woods and I'm going to see if we can hear anything. All this goes to show that the evidence for Bigfoot is severely lacking, and for these guys to assume that it exists shows their bias. I'm not denying that they had an experience. I'm sure they did, but it's a huge stretch from an experience to the existence of an elusive cryptid. If Bigfoot does indeed exist, we would have a lot more evidence of their existence instead of having pareidolia mixed with confirmation bias and eyewitness accounts the furthest thing from actual scientific evidence. If this is what you consider evidence, moneymaker, you're doing science wrong. This has been Paranormal Skeptic Academy. If you like what I do, head on over to patreon.com slash PSA. And for as little as $2 an episode, you can help support my efforts. Each patron will receive the video version of the normal episodes along with a special RSS feed to add to your favorite podcatcher. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at CWeb619. Send me feedback at ParanormalSkepticAcademy at gmail.com. Like the Facebook page and leave me a review on iTunes and Stitcher. This has been Paranormal Skeptic Academy, schooling your favorite ghost hunters. <laughs>